And uh, welcome back. Take my hat off here. Messed up my hair, didn't I? <laughs> Good to see everybody today. Uh, we're looking uh, again in First Thessalonians chapter two. Uh, we completed chapter one, just ten verses, and now we go to chapter two. And here, uh, Paul proves uh, that he was sincere and not a charlatan, and uh, the integrity of Paul's ministry uh, in Thessalonica uh, is confirmed. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we go any far further, okay? Now let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you. You are such a wonderful, merciful, kind God, and we give thee thanks for all the wonders that we're able to enjoy and the splendors of life. We ask for your divine blessing to be upon our study that your Holy Spirit would come and be amongst us and in us in such a way that uh, we hear your voice and we respond to your leading. Uh, give us understanding and help us as we uh, look into your word. We give thee thanks in advance. In Jesus Christ's name, amen and amen. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. First Thessalonians chapter 2. In case you hadn't gotten turned to it, I'll give you a moment. Oh, wonderful. That moment is up, amen. <laughs> okay. Uh, marks of Paul's ministry. Let's read the first two verses. It says here, For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of the God uh, of God in much conflict. Now he begins by saying, "Now you know these things." Uh, he defended uh, his own character and ministry to the uh, Thessalonians. Uh, this wasn't because Paul was insincere or insecure about his ministry, but because he had a lot of enemies in Thessalonica. We know that from uh, Acts chapter 17 and also, uh, well, a couple of places in Acts 17. Uh, they discredited him in his absence, especially because of his hurried departure from Thessalonica. Paul's enemies said that he left town quickly because he was self a self-serving coward. That's what, what, what they said. I mean, uh, I know that whenever a pastor leaves uh, a, a, a church, you know, for whatever reason, to go on to another uh, church or field of ministry, that it is a natural tendency uh, to be critical of them after uh, they're gone, as if it wasn't enough while they were there. Uh, but after they're gone, they can't defend themselves. Well, he, Paul was coming back. Amen. Uh, it's unfortunate that this uh, had to take place. I want to share with you some things by a, a, a feller named uh, uh, Barclay. Barclay, B-A-R-C-L-A-Y. Yeah, uh, he had some wonderful uh, things to say about this and uh, following uh, the fir false charges against uh, uh, Paul. It was evident from the way Paul explained himself in this chapter that uh, Paul was uh, has a police record <laughs> and is therefore untrustworthy, 1 Thessalonians 2.2. Uh, suffered before uh, referring to his imprisonment in Thessalonica. You know, what a wonderful thing to happen to get a police record for standing up for God. Amen. Oh, my. Uh, Paul is 
they said de delusional when it says uh, error in verse 3. Paul's ministry is based on impure motives. Again, verse 3, uh, uncleanness was one of them. Paul deliver, uh, deliberately uh, delivers, deceives others, uh, we see also uh, in their accusation. Paul preaches to please others and not God. Uh, it goes on in verse 4 and tells you that. Paul in it, is in the ministry as a mercenary. Uh, to get what he can get uh, out of it, material. Now, now I, there's there's a lot of preachers that that are uh, mercenaries. It's what they can get out of it. Uh, it it's it's uh, they're they're waiting to seize on, on uh, uh, elevating themselves in, in uh, bigger and better and richer churches. Uh, nothing wrong with being called to a rich church, but if that's your motive. Uh, they shouldn't be calling you, I'll tell you that. Uh, uh, it says this in uh, verse 5, it says, nor a cloak of covetousness. Uh, Paul only wants personal glory, some said in verse 6, uh, nor did we seek glory for men, he said. Uh, Paul is something of a dictator. Uh, we were gentle among you, he responds to that. Our coming to you, uh, that was by Barclay. Our coming to you, he said, uh, it was not in vain. The word vain here uh, can refer to either to the result of the ministry or the character of the ministry because it was evident to everyone that Paul's ministry in Thessalonica was a success. Uh, it is better to see it as a reference to the character of Paul's ministry. He, his coming was not empty or hollow, as if uh, he were a, a mere salesman or a marketeer. You know, uh, I always, uh, salesmen, you know, have a gift, I think. Uh, to be a, a good salesman, it's a gift. And, and I never was a good salesman. I, I tried being a salesman once, and Boy, that just wasn't my my cup of tea. Uh, Paul wasn't a salesman or a marketer. He was he was a, a, an evangelist to the Gentiles. Now, let's go back to our text. It says, even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated in Philippi, Paul reminds the uh, the church at the, uh, Thessalonica of his sufferings in his ministry. Uh, through this, he made the point that he would not carry on the face of beatings, in the face of beatings and conflict, if he were in it only for himself. He wouldn't have done all that. When Paul arrived in Thessalonica, uh, the wounds on his back from Philippi, they were still fresh, they were still raw. And if Paul was in it for himself, he wasn't very smart about serving his own self-interest. I don't mean to laugh, but that, that's ridiculous. Uh, Paul also says, uh, here he says, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much, much conflict. Despite what some of Paul's accusers said, he did not only preach the gospel when it was uh, easy or convenient, he knew what it was like to speak boldly for the Lord, even in much conflict. He knew that he was going to run into to, uh, uh, brick walls, so to speak, uh, lots of trouble. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, all right. Verse 3 through 5, uh, the integrity of Paul's message in Thessalonica. Uh, for our exhortation, and let's read it, for our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, uh, nor was it 
in deceit, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so, even so, we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Uh, for neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God, he says, is witness. Oh, boy. Let's look at this one closer. It says, for our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness. The purity of Paul's message made it apparent that there was no deceit, uncleanness, or guile in his ministry. In the first century world Paul lived in, there were many competing religions, by the way. And many ministers of those religions were motivated by greed and gain. gain. There are a lot of religions uh, uh, compete. You know, there is competition between uh, churches, Christian churches, uh, for, you know, some of them proselyte. You know, they do their best to get people out of other churches to come to their churches. That is dead wrong. Don't do it. Uh, don't be a party to, a party to it. Paul uh, wasn't greedy in that sense, and it wasn't for his own gain. That's obvious. Uh, it says, as we have been approved by God. Paul used the word uh, here that was associated with approving someone as being fit for public service, just as uh, Athenians were tested for their fitness before they were allowed to assume public office. So the missionaries were tested before they were commissioned as God's messengers, uh, so says Hebert. Uh, that, by the way, is, is uh, kind of, that happens now. Uh, even so, our text says, even so, we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Paul knew his gospel wouldn't always please men, but he knew that it was pleasing to God. You know, uh, you, you to think about it. A preacher preaches hellfire and brimstone. Uh, people don't like to hear that or tells them they're a sinner and they're going to hell unless they've been born again. People do not want to hear that truth. That is what Jesus said. Therefore, it can be relied upon. Uh, but for the most part, you know, they, they want a social gospel nowadays. They want a gospel that, you know, you know let's, we all love each other. We are one. That's baloney. We are not one. We are one in Christ. Outside of that, we, we're we not nothing. We, we, we're uh, at odds with God. You have to be at one with Christ. Uh, but uh, a lot of them just want to be one with the church. Oh, excuse me, my stomach's growling. I need something to eat, don't I? All right, excuse me. All right, now it says, For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. Paul understood that covetousness always has a cloak. Uh, it always, uh, it is always concealed by a noble sounding goal, you know. Uh, uh, but Paul did not use the flattering words that often are a cloak of covetousness. Uh, you got to be careful there. All right, verse 6 and 7. Uh, here we see Paul's uh, gentle, humble attitude among the Thessalonians demonstrated stated his motives were pure. Uh, let's read verse 6 and 7. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands on as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own 
children. He says, nor did we seek glory from men. When Paul ministered among these people, he was unconcerned for his personal glory. He didn't need fancy introductions or lavish praise. His satisfaction came from his relationship with Jesus, not from the praise of people. Uh, next time you have a visiting preacher, make sure that uh, uh, it should be that way. It should be 10 minutes of uh, telling uh, their accolades all that they've done. That's baloney. They're not there for that. They're there to preach the gospel. Uh, it says Paul didn't seek glory from men because his needs for sec security and acceptance were met primarily in Jesus. That's where his security lay. Uh, this meant that he didn't spend his life trying to seek and earn the acceptance of man. Uh, he ministered from an understanding of his identity in Jesus. And now that's good. Uh, it says we might, uh, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. Paul was among the Thessalonians to give something to them, not to take something from them. He did not come making demands as an apostle. Uh, but we were gentle, he says, among you. Paul was like a nursing mother. Uh, who only looks to give her child uh, what's, what that child needs. Um, now, let's look at verse 8 and 9. I, I want to take a sip of my coffee and take questions. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. You know, uh, by the way, I have gotten some questions here lately on some of the studies we've done, and and I've an answered them as best I can directly. I haven't shared with the uh, with uh, us in our our uh, broadcast. I'll I'll uh, do that if they if people say to do it when they have a question. All right, verse eight and nine. Uh, Paul's self-support and hard working among the Thessalonians demonstrated that his motives were pure. He proved it by his actions. Here's what it says, verse eight and nine. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. Wow. As he says, we were well pleased to impart to you only, not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives in this text. Uh, the sacrifices Paul endured for the sake of ministry to the Thessalonians was not a burden. Uh, he was well pleased to do it. He was glad to do it because Paul uh, was affectionately longing for the Thessalonians because they had become dear to Paul and his associates. Uh, affectionately, uh, Longing for you, he says, is from an extreme rare verb of, <coughs> excuse me, obscure origin. Uh, Wallenberg conjectured that it was a term of endearment derived from the language of the nursery. Or he also said in this text, but also our own lives. Paul's preaching was effective because he gave not only the gospel, but himself as well, also our own lives. And he gave because of love. You had become dear to us, he says. Uh, he says, for you remember, brethren, our labor and toil. Paul recognized his right to be supported by those he ministered to. 
1 Corinthians 9, 14 tells us that, but voluntarily gave up the right to set himself apart uh, from missionaries of false religions. Uh, Paul denied his right and took a higher standard upon himself. Uh, well, it, it spoke for itself, didn't it? All right, verse 10 through 12. Paul's own behavior and message to the Thessalonians demonstrates the integrity of his character before God and man. He says, you are witnesses and God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Glory, hallelujah. That's verses 10 through 12. Now let's look at those just a little bit closer. Said you are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. It is impressive that Paul could freely appeal to his own life as an example. Um, he repeated the same idea in other passages to to the letter to the Philippians and also in First Corinthians. Uh, this was a worthy goal and is a worthy goal for any Christian today to live a life that declares how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among others. Uh, this is the kind of life that draws others to follow uh, Jesus for themselves. I didn't always accomplish that, but I tried. Um, he says we how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you that you would walk worthy of God. Paul himself lived justly, it says, and blamelessly. But he also told the Thessalonians they should live the same way. You know, it's, it's do as I do, not just do as I say. Demonstrate examples. Uh, he could tell them that they should walk worthy of God because his life and message was consistent. You know, you can you can tell people and preach to people, but if you go out there and you you act like the devil, they're not going to pay no attention to anything you have to say. Uh, what do they call that? A hypocrite? Does that come to mind? I think so. Sorry. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Paul is thankful that they welcomed the gospel of God's message, not man's. For this reason, he says, this is the text. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. <laughs> Excuse me. It works in believers. He says, when you receive the word of God, he, he, he believed and taught others that God has spoken to man, and the, we have recorded this word of God. Paul believed in a voice that speaks to mankind with the authority of eternity. Uh, and he speaks above mere human opinion. Uh, since we do have the word of God, we have a tr true voice of authority. You know, they could say anything they want, the media. Uh, on TV, on the radio, uh, your neighbors, your friends, but it's wonderful for a preacher to stand up in the pulpit and say, Thus saith the Lord from the text that God has given us. What a marvelous thing, isn't it? He says, 
you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God. The Thessalonians received the word of God as it is in truth. Paul presented it not as the word of men, and they received it as the word of God. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't. I've heard preachers say, well, this is kind of an obscure passage. We're not even sure that it was meant to be in the Bible. Baloney. It's a nice way, isn't it? That's of saying it. From cover to cover in the Bible, you can say, thus saith the Lord. It's the word of God. He said also, which also effectively works in you who believe. Paul's confidence in the word of God wasn't a matter of wishful thinking or blind faith. Uh, he could see that it effectively works in those who believe. God's word works. It doesn't only bring information or produce feelings. There is a power in the word of God to change lives. You know, feelings can be very deceptive. I've known people that their lives, as, as far as their Christian walk, was ruined because they kept looking for a lightning bolt out of heaven to knock them down. You know, they wanted that uh, uh, Macedonian uh, uh, road experience that Paul had. Well, let me tell you all something. God uh, more often speaks in a still, small voice. And he speaks to your heart. Feelings is not something, uh, it's a good thing if it's uh, properly inspired by the Lord, but oftentimes our feelings uh, get in the way and they get hurt. Uh, we must depend on God and what he says. Not in how, how do you feel about it? You know, I can present the gospel and say for the invitation, okay, how do you feel about it? I don't care how you feel about it. Has God spoken to you? Amen. Uh, amen. I believe that. Uh, well, we're getting down... Uh, to a bigger portion, and I think it's about time for us to to uh, close this. We're going to pick up next week at verse 14. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. Uh, now we're going to, this is all preliminary, I think, we're going to get to a place in this the letters to the Thessalonians where Paul lays it out as far as uh, prophecy, and it's very important that you be there when we get when we arrive. So uh, we're going to keep going, though we don't want to leave any portion of this out. And we're next uh, starting next week. We're going to. Uh, See how the Thessalonians welcome suffering when they welcome the word, yet they stood stand fast, steadfast, even though it meant to suffer. That's a true mark of a, a real conversion experience, isn't it? All right, let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word. We're grateful for what you uh, ha have given us, and now we, may we uh, not just admire Paul and 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 his life and his work, but let us admire the God that took a, a wretched sinner, a criminal, uh, someone who was uh, at one time an antichrist, and changed him into a leader for your people. Help us to be leaders for your people and to others who are outside the faith. We give you the honor and the glory and say thank you. In the name of Jesus, everybody said, Amen.